Awesome. And then what I'll do for this last one is pause in different places. So if you're with me live today, you can participate um, when I when we pause. And then if you're watching this later on, you can just go ahead and hit that pause button and kind of do this as a workshop on your own as well. So I titled this third workshop in our weight loss series, Next Level, which it could be <laughs> um, that you decide to keep this idea in mind, or you might just be thinking about, okay, how do I kind of wrap up this part of my journey and how do I move forward into the next part of the journey? And that's really kind of what this is about. So I don't have that many slides. This is just mostly looking at, um, you know, what we have accomplished so far and kind of taking that bird's eye view. So here's our overview. First of all, I did want to kind of go over a couple of behavioral change theories. And I am not in the psychology <laughs> division or department. Um, I, I don't have a background in behavioral change per se. Um, we do use this a lot though with personal training and with fitness instruction and with what I'm working on right now for my own professional development, which is health coaching. And so it's helpful to understand the kind of theories that support what we do when fitness professionals are trying to help other people to improve their own um, fitness and their and change their lifestyle behaviors. So I wanted to go over just a couple of real, really basic theories that we use and see if that's helpful to you. And then there are actually three things I want to do in this workshop and that's celebrate how far we've come, um, what we've been doing so far, learn from our experience, and then how do we get into moving forward? What's the next thing? Um, and this can be a little bit complicated, you know. Do we always need to have a set of goals that we're working towards when it comes to our health and wellness? Um, can we kind of just get to a point where it's such a part of our lifestyle that we can just coast, right? And when do we need to kind of check in with ourselves and maybe refocus back to what we really want out of our wellness? Um, and then we'll have a portion at the end for some Q&A. And like I said in the beginning, we can pause um, at different points throughout this workshop to kind of check in with ourselves and with each other. So let's move forward here. Um, so when it comes to behavioral change, there's actually uh, quite a bit of, of theory and research, and a lot of it did start, um, I think, back in kind of the psychological boom of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and onward. And there's been a lot since then that's kind of added to this. Um, a lot of what we use in fitness and even in the health coaching program I'm going through is focused on positive psychology. So basically building what's strong rather than focusing on what's wrong. So it is dissimilar, it's not the same as actual psychological therapy for mental health. It is completely different. What we are focusing on is goal setting, um, reevaluating those goals, how do we uh, help people and coach people to set those goals and really build self-efficacy. So one of the main theories that we start with is self-determination theory. And self-determination theory, um, and again, like I said, I'm not a psychologist, I don't have this background, but this is kind of an overview of what I know about it. Um, it really is, the overarching theory is emphasizing a person's ability to kind of reach their optimal self. If you think about um, Maslow's hierarchy, if you remember that from your undergrad days, or um, if you're familiar at all, that's basically a hierarchy of human needs, right? We need things like air, water, sleep, food, ex exercise, physical activity. We need all those things at the very bottom just for survival and for our health, and then we need to feel safe, and then we need to feel a sense of belonging, and then we need to work on ourselves, right? We need to have a sense of purpose and self-actualization. And this kind of plays into that. This self-determination theory is the idea that a person has the capacity to reach their highest level of motivation, engagement, performance, persistence, and creativity. And along those lines, what is needed in order for a person to do that? So there are a few needs that are outlined within self-determination theory. The first one is autonomy. We realize that people are autonomous. And they have a need to be autonomous. Um, we see this in kids. <laughs> I always come back to kids because my daughter is going to turn five this year. 
And so I see this need for autonomy <laughs> definitely blossoming right now. But you can see that even younger, right? One, two years old. No, it's mine. I want to do it. Don't do it for me. Don't tie my shoes for me. I got this. That's what my daughter's favorite favorite saying right now. Is, I got this, mom. I got this. Um, and we as adults, we need that as well. We need to know that we are in control of our choices, that we can have our own reasons, and we get to decide our actions, right? Um, and even if we feel like we have limited choices, we can make decisions within that. And so that sense of autonomy, not that I'm doing this for someone else or that someone else is telling me, my doctor is telling me or my spouse is telling me I have to do this or society is telling me I need to, to do this and be this, but we get to decide that. That's an important part of self-determination um, and actually reaching our optimal sense of wellness. And then the second need is a need for competence. And competence is really a combination of both confidence and effectiveness. So we have to have the confidence in ourselves to know that we can complete something and that we have power, we have autonomy, right? Um, we have skills, we have strengths. And then we also have to have that coupled with a really effective system, right? So we have the capacity to develop the structure that's needed in order to reach our goals. Um, this is really what develops competence, and we know that this happens over time. It, it can't be just something that you wake up one morning and say, I'm confident that I can do this. This is built up over a long period of time, and smaller successes building into larger successes. And then the last one is relatedness. Um, very few people can do this on their own and stretch out on their own, um, and so we do need a support system. And that's why one of the questions that we have asked in the first two uh, workshops were, what support systems do you have, right? Um, who can you think of that is supportive of you in, with this goal? And what systems are already in place, right? And that can be people. Um, and in this sense, it is people, right? The relatedness is with people. And often we also associate that with structures as well or environments. Like if my husband is supporting my dietary changes, then my husband's not going to necessarily bring home a, a cake, right? Or something that um, he knows is going to derail me. Um, so friends, family, and it could also be a professional relationship like with a coach or a trainer. All of that relatedness helps us to develop this. Eventually what can come from this, and this is present in pretty much all of the theories that I have come across so far in terms of behavioral change, um, is this concept of self-efficacy, right? And this is different than self-esteem or self-worth, where we know that we have value as a person and that we're worthy of love and belonging and attention. Self-efficacy is our belief in our own ability to accomplish something, right? And that relates directly to behaviors and goals. We may have everything that we need in order to accomplish a goal. We may have a great plan. We may have a great training and coach. We may have access to, you know, all of these facilities or all these resources, but if we don't believe that we can do it, we're probably not going to take those first steps, right? And so self-efficacy is something that we can develop over time, and it doesn't necessarily even have to be in that particular activity that we're trying to accomplish, right? If I've had an experience in my past, like I learned a new skill or I learned a new hobby, it can be a different thing that I'm trying to accomplish. Maybe I you know, took martial arts classes and developed that and, and got it earned a belt. And I can relate that then to, oh, I'm going to go pursue an advanced degree now. Just like I did with earning that belt in martial arts, I can put that same commitment and effort into this degree and I will be able to do it, right? This is coming from a coaching psychology manual written by Margaret Moore and others. Um, that's part of a health coaching uh, certification. This is something that we um, teach in personal training, and actually the, the third-party certification body that we work with is the National Academy of Sports Medicine, or NASM. Oops. Oh, hold on. <laughs> so this is kind of just a reminder, and it's a reminder to, that I give to trainers, up-and-coming trainers as professionals, that Change is not an overnight thing, it's a staged process. And what's important to remember, even though this is, is uh, presented in a very linear, 
framework is that it's not linear. Um, we do go through these different stages, and these different stages are, uh, stages are things like pre-contemplation before we're even thinking about it. Contemplation is just when we are considering it, preparation, we're getting ready, action, and then maintenance. Um, and it's kind of characterized by these ideas for ourselves. I won't or I can't do it is this pre-contemplation stage. Contemplation is I may do it or I'm thinking about doing it. And then preparation is I, I will do it. I'm going to do this. And then action is I am doing this, right? And then maintenance is I'm still doing this. So it's the important thing to remember is that we can go back and forth in between these stages. And it's often a cyclical process, right? We move to contemplation, then maybe back to pre-contemplation, or we move from contemplation to preparation, and then back and forth. And sometimes we go from action or from maintenance all the way back to pre-contemplation or contemplation, right? And so we can go back and forth between these. The self-efficacy is built when we can spend longer periods of time in action and or maintenance, right? And if we have the support system that can help us to move through contemplation and preparation, or if we have done it before and we're back in contemplation, typically we won't hang out here as long, right? Because we'll know, I did this already, or I've done something similar before, and this can be accomplished. I've, I've been there before. I know what it's like. Um, so that's just a little bit of the theory that is somewhat useful, depending on, on uh, the situation. And again, it's, you know, this is um, observation, right? Most of this is observation that we're looking at people and saying, how do people change? Um, so you have to take it as, okay, does this help me? Does this work for me? And what can I use from this to apply to my own process? So here's the fun part. Um, for us, it has been three months. Um, and we've gone through a couple different workshops. It maybe have been, has been two months since the first one. Um, so I want to check in with you on a few questions. And I'll go ahead and pause after I ask the questions. Or if you're watching the recording, hit pause, write them down, or share them with a partner, or share them with someone you trust. Um, so first of all, we want to focus on the best things. So as humans, we, we like to look at our challenges. We like to look at, I think my problem was this, right? But that doesn't help us build self-efficacy. <laughs> and it also doesn't help us actually solve the problem. So we start with the, the positive. What has been your best experience or have been your best experiences? What are you proud of yourself for? What strengths have you used so far? And what has worked really well for you? And it might not be something that you were expecting when you started out. So I'm going to go ahead and pause right here and we can share with each other in a minute. So our next step is, okay, now that we have celebrated and, and uh, you can still celebrate, <laughs> you can celebrate as much as you want. I would highly encourage you to think of some sort of, um, whether it's a reward or it's just a moment where you take and you kind of self-reflect and think about, oh, this is positive, right? What have I done that's, that's already positive and successful and, and makes my strength shine? Um, whatever that is, uh, you know, some people attach a reward to it that's tangible, and that can certainly be done too. Um, I encourage people to make that tangible reward something not related to food or exercise or anything like that, something that you just really enjoy doing so that it doesn't carry that uh, kind of motivational um, <laughs> muddiness with it. But continue to do that for yourself, right? You deserve to celebrate what you have done. This, um, what we do to, you know, take care of ourselves, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> it takes effort and you deserve to celebrate that. So now we can look at what we have learned. And, you know, when I was playing sports in college and I played tennis and I didn't win a lot. <laughs> and so it was really helpful for me to look back at my losses and think about what can I learn from them? And instead of, you know, I, I know we've, a lot of us have heard the old quote, you know, you don't win or lose, you win and learn. And that really does help. Sometimes I learned more from a match that I didn't win than I did from my, my win, right? Um, and that actually helped me build skill in the future. So when we're looking for what can we learn, and a lot of you already brought some of these things in, were what were some of the challenges you faced along the way? 
And sometimes this happens when we set goals that are either too large or um, too easy, not motivating enough, right? And maybe we take a look at the goal and we say, you know, this is a real challenge. Maybe it was a challenge to, let's take, for example, walking every day uh, before work. Um, you know, that might be the perfect time for many people to walk is before work. And for other people, you know, maybe they have kids that they have to get ready in the morning. And so that's actually not a great time. And that was the challenge that I, you know, faced was that it wasn't a good time for me. So what can I learn from that is I need to schedule that. I still want to walk, but I need to schedule it at a different time of day. Or maybe it was the weather, right? I really wanted to get out there and walk and then it was raining. Whatever it was, what are some of those, the overarching challenges that you face along the way? How did you overcome them? So that has to do with problem solving. And maybe you didn't overcome them yet. And you can start thinking about how will I overcome them, right? How can I still get back to this? It could even be reshaping the goal itself. Maybe that particular goal is not appropriate or doesn't apply anymore. Maybe you want to change it, right? Maybe it needs to be a different goal. Maybe, you know, instead of taking um, the boxing class, maybe you need to do the strength training class. Or maybe because the weather is turning a little bit better, you need to be outside. Whatever that goal is, it can change. And you can use this to adapt it. And then what have you learned about yourself? And this can include what your dreams are. Um, in the very first workshop, we went over how to create a wellness vision and what that vision can, can look like. A really powerful, motivating vision is something that includes your deep dreams and desires that you want for your own wellness experience. And that can change too. <laughs> Sometimes we lay that out and we realize, you know what, this isn't really what I want. What I want is this. I want to have this experience around my wellness and that needs to be with X, Y, Z. So you can use this to reassess that, right? Um, and what are your needs? And that could be a part of this learning process too is I need more structure or I need daily reminders or I need a, a, you know, an alarm on my phone or I need more social support. Whatever it is, you can start to identify those things. What do I need from this experience? Then at the very end of this kind of self-assessment, you can take a look and say, what percentage of success would you apply to your goal? And this can be, it's very arbitrary. There's no judgment around it. There's no percentage of success that's good or bad does not matter. But this is a way for you to kind of assess um, how you are changing over time, right? And if, if the goal is working. So if you can use this percentage of success to say, okay, um, this percentage of success, I, I'm happy with this. I don't need to change anything. This is reasonable enough to keep moving forward, right? Or you can take a look at that and say, it's kind of neither here nor there, right? This is good and someday I'll be more um, successful than others. And you can also say, well, you know what? This one didn't work well for me. This particular goal didn't work well for me, it looks like. So I'm going to change that goal to something that hopefully will work well for me. And that will be a new experiment, right? To kind of figure out um, <laughs> whether or not this new one will work. So let's pause right here. So the last part, which we've already kind of talked about a little bit, is what is next? How do we move forward? And this can kind of be, you know, if you've reached your goal, if you, uh, you know, completed a 5K or a triathlon or, you know, whatever it was that you were like, I'm working towards this specific goal. Sometimes it can be a little bit of a letdown. Um, years ago, <laughs> over a decade ago, I ran the LA Marathon and, um, I trained for it really hard and I went through it. It was long, it was painful, it was exhausting. And I remember for the two weeks after the marathon, I was mildly depressed. <laughs> I was sore, I didn't wanna do anything and I was like, it's over. What do I have now to look forward to? What do I have to train for? And you know, in, in the meantime, I was still recovering too, so my body was sore, I didn't feel like exercising at all. But it kind of does, it can throw you for a, a loop there. And you're like, I've met this goal. What do I do now, right? How do I move forward? So the important thing is to remember that we can always find the next thing. We can take a moment to celebrate what we've done, 
to look back and learn from what we've done. And then moving forward, it's okay to find a new thing that doesn't even relate, right? We can have a goal to maintain. We can have a goal to research and learn something new. We can have a goal to keep going with our action, right? Um, there are all kinds of goals. And eventually you can get to the point where you don't have to necessarily set a smart goal around it. It can be something where you're looking to maintain what I currently have, keep going. Um, and maybe it becomes less cognitive at that point and more automatic. But if you're looking for that next goal, if you're looking for that next really motivating thing, you can ask yourself, what are you now ready to pursue? So maybe um, I completed the marathon and actually I realized the learn part for myself was I don't like long distance running. <laughs> I like running, but not that long distance. So the next thing for me was, okay, I want to get faster than a shorter distance. So I'm going to register for a 5K. And so that's what I did. I, you know, took several months in, in advance and I said, okay, this 5K I can do in the fall. Um, and it might be something completely different that you didn't think was possible before you got to where you are now. So maybe there's something you've always wanted to try. Or um, here's an example. Uh, my mom, who's a personal trainer, said that during the pandemic, a lot of her clients were afraid of Zoom and afraid of Zoom training. But once they got into it and they kind of got over the fear of the Zoom training and they realized, oh, this is just like my session. Then they started thinking about, well, maybe, maybe I should buy a Peloton <laughs> and start doing Peloton, right? Or maybe I can do one of those on-demand workouts. And so it could open up a new door for you to, to discover something or try something that you didn't think was possible beforehand. So keep exploring, keep your eyes open. Um, and just remember, again, there all, are all kinds of goals. It does not have to be a harder goal than what you just accomplished even, right? A lot of times in fitness, we think, okay, I always have to be building, I always have to be getting harder. No, it does not always have to be harder. Um, you can take a look at what's happening in your life right then and say, okay, well, I need to shift my focus to X, Y, Z. So maybe my goals for wellness are going to shift to recovery and managing my stress or whatever, learning more about uh, mindfulness or something like that. And so, it, it, again, it doesn't always have to be going harder or doing more. I would encourage you, though, even if you are kind of loosely setting that SMART goal, set in a new date to check with your, in with yourself and kind of go through this process to celebrate what you've already done, to learn from what you have just accomplished, and then pick the next thing to help keep you moving forward. So that's where we are. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the presentation right here. Oh, this is one more reminder of what SMART means when it comes to goals. Um, it stands, it's an acronym. It stands for specific, measurable, actionable, or attainable. There's different um, ways of expressing it realistic and timely, which just means that it's outlining specifically what you want to accomplish. It's something that you can measure. So um, there's a, a pre and a post. Basically, you have a before. This is this is my starting point. This is what I, where I want to get, whether it's an outcome or an action goal, right? And that's where actionable, I like the, the term actionable a little bit better um, because I like to set action goals to go with my outcome goal. So if, if someone has a weight loss goal, right, they want to lose X number of pounds, and then it's helpful to put an action goal along with it that says, I'm going to exercise three days per week following um, this uh, workout plan, right, for a month, and then I'll check in with myself, right? So the action goal eventually helps us build up to the outcome goal. Um, and then, again, it should be something that's realistic for the time frame that you've given yourself. And I think that's where attainable comes in right? Um, if I'm trying to uh, run faster or go from walking to running, I need to give myself time to do that, right? So typically we say somewhere between 8 to 12 weeks is a good time frame. What can I accomplish within that time frame? But you can go shorter. You can go as short as a month. You can set a more long-term goal, but it is helpful to get those kind of short-term goals that help you to build up to that long-term goal. So six, typically about six to 12 weeks is a good time frame for a lot of these. So I'm going to go ahead and end it here. Um, and then we can have some time for a Q&A. And like I said, please feel free to email me or contact me if you're watching this later and you want to 
clarify something or if you have any questions. Thank you.